Welcome in, everybody. We are live from the Herd at Sports Bar and Grill here in La Vista, Nebraska, in the Omaha area. Tonight, we're going to go through some of the top teams in the Big Ten because I'm told that we are in Big Ten country, not SEC, not Big 12. So we're going to have to go through the Big Ten around here. Uh, we're going to be discussing some of the top teams, kind of the reactions to the team's futures, uh, kind of after spring ball and everything that's gone on in the spring football, uh, including, you know, newcomers to the team going throughout the portal, uh, going through the recruiting processes, new coaches, just an overall overlook uh, of just about everything, kind of a look ahead to their season and their new team in 2024, because every team is a new team once we get to 2024, once we get into a new season. So for those who don't know who we are, this is Rising to the Occasion. I'm your host, Josh Mahler. I'm joined by my two co-hosts. I've got Jeremy here to my left and Blake on the screen for you. Um, and then we're also joined by a guest co-host, Ravi Lula, uh, also the, the host of the Herd at Sports radio show. Uh, I guess first, go ahead and start off and let everybody know who you are, Rob, Ravi. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm Ravi Lula. We do the Herd at Sports radio show from this very stage every morning, 7 to 10, 8, well, every weekday morning. I don't work weekends. Um, but <laughs> 7 to 10 a.m. Uh, and so we uh, we have a good time, me and Damon Benning, and you can find us on all Herd at Sports uh, social medias or if you're here in town, AM590 ESPN Omaha. Yeah, awesome. And thank you very much for joining us here. I, I know that you're a Big Ten guy I and mean, you're a Nebraska guy, so I knew that it was probably a good good thing to have you on and kind of help us go through these Big Ten teams. But uh, we're, we're going to go down the list uh, and kind of start off. We're going to go down the list with some of the top Big Ten teams and, of course, have to touch on Nebraska. We're probably going to push that one back towards the end. Got to the best for last. Yeah, so go ahead and <laughs> go ahead and stick around for that. Um, first, starting off with arguably the best team, uh, and probably not arguably the best team in the Big Ten, arguably the best team in the nation coming into next season. Starting off with Ohio State, Coach Ryan Day's team, they've won eighty six, almost eighty seven percent of their games since he took over the Ohio State program back in two thousand nineteen. The Buckeyes they've defeated every single Big Ten opponent uh, in the regular season the past three seasons except for one, and that's Michigan, <laughs> yeah. uh, that team up north, as, as they would say, in Ohio. Uh, unfortunately for Ryan Day, Ohio State, they've lost the Wolverines three straight times, uh, which has really been the curse of that program here in the last you know three seasons since he's been there, mm -hmm. uh, which hasn't been done for quite some time before that. Um, but really, you know, after Michigan won their college football national title uh, and, and going on, former uh, coach Jim Harbaugh last season, uh, moving on, the Buckeyes now, they kind of re really increased their efforts in the transfer portal mainly, that's the big big part that they really use. They really leaned on that transfer portal, kind of going in and trying to find guys that could kind of fit into their puzzle uh, and be key pieces and try to help them out. Uh, they've added some absolute studs on the squad too. And that's why, honestly, I think this is, you know, one of the best teams, if not the best team coming into 2024. Um, you know, looking around, you, they've, they've got five-star safety, Caleb Downs from Alabama. Uh, they've got Quinshaw Judkins, halfback from Ole Miss. You've got Will Howard, a QB who came over from K-State. A little bit of a questionable one for me. Um, but then, of course, they also brought in, I guess, sort of a, a transfer slash recruit in Julian Sayan, also from Alabama, uh, who he, he committed to Alabama, went through some practices, but then had to transfer over uh, to Ohio State in order to get eligibility. Um, another Alabama guy that they brought in was Seth McLaughlin, a center from there. Uh, so just adding to that team, and I guess before we get too far into the, just the players, also talking about the, the coaching staff, um, one of the biggest things that I think most people would have had a, 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 a uh, hard time with Ohio State and picking them to, to be such a great team was their offense. Um, and now Ryan Day kind of hands over the offense to Chip Kelly, uh, former UCLA, former Oregon, former Eagles coach, uh, a, a, an offensive mastermind. So he, they, they pick up uh, Chip Kelly and add him to their staff on offense as an offensive coordinator, handing him the playbook and letting him call plays. So I mean, just a ton when you talk about that. Uh, and so, you know, when you when you add a guy that's going to be your sole call player now, instead of having to uh, call that as a head coach as well, I think that's that that kind of adds to the list quite a bit. But just a huge list of, of guys that come over. I mean, Ravi, I'll start off with you since you're our guest. I mean, looking at Ohio State, I feel like it's pretty hard to argue that this might be the best team in the Big Ten coming into next season. Yeah, I mean, the biggest question mark is that Will Howard spot that you mentioned at quarterback. Obviously, he was one of the most touted transfers in the portal, but we get this kind of skewed view of guys once they get into the portal. Like, best guy in the portal doesn't automatically make him good. Yeah, right. Yeah, and we kind of get this weird they do in basketball too where you're like oh is the best guy available on the portal it's like 
Yeah. Yeah, but what does that make him in relation to everybody that stayed, right? I don't know. Will Howard's a nice football player. Is he a significant upgrade or over McCord? I, I don't know. Maybe. I, what I do know is they've got a lot of options at quarterback, yeah, even if Will Howard sure. isn't that guy, right? You mentioned Julian saying Aaron Nolan is a huge recruit yeah. that's coming in as a true freshman as well. You still have Lincoln uh, Kleinholz, who was a, a big recruit coming in. He's a redshirt freshman. Mm-hmm. And then you still got Devin Brown floating around there. Yeah, I yeah. think like, I, I don't, I, yeah, assume, I haven't heard anything from I, him. I, so assume, <laughs> I assume he's over there. As yeah. of today, he's still uh, on that roster. So you're talking about five guys at quarterback that at one time or another were really highly regarded or have been highly productive already in Will Howard's case. I just don't look at Will Howard and go, that's the, that's going to be the guy that leads the best team in the country. Yeah. Like that's not the vibe I get from Will Howard. Now, maybe I'm, not being fair to him maybe he's going to be a great fit with chip kelly with a little bit more uh run focused the quarterback a game there but i just will howard's a huge question mark for me even though i think he's a good player i think for the stakes he's been playing for versus what ohio state's going to be playing mm-hmm. for is a totally different ball game as well and then the other thing you brought up with with ryan day is yeah they've won 87 percent of their games he could get fired this year if he loses. Michigan. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's so crazy to me. You know, looking at looking at what he's been able to do, he yeah. can't win that one game. Which obviously, that one game keeps him out of the big game. Yeah, uh, and but so, it won't anymore. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah not, it won't. You don't no, no divisions anymore. with a twelve-team playoff with no divisions. He can lose to Michigan every year and still make the playoff. He could win a national championship every year and still lose to <laughs> yeah, Michigan. Yeah. And I like I legit I know it sounds ridiculous. They could go to college football playoff every year. And if he keeps losing to Michigan, he's going to get fired. Yeah. You would think. Like full stop. He just is going to get fired. And that's that's kind of the the problem with you know, you're creating your own success and creating your own expectations. Ryan Day's put himself in this situation where they're so good that it becomes sort of his own worst enemy, this machine that he's created. If he can't figure out a way to beat a Michigan team, which I'm sure we're going to, I know we're going to get to, that I think is gettable this year. Mm-hmm. If he can't figure out a way to get him this year, he he's legitimately in some trouble. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, looking at looking at him though, I, I don't think he's going to have a problem with Michigan. We'll get to Michigan a little later, but uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a big They're question definitely mark. Better. There. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. But what and, happens in that game is a total crapshoot. Yeah, yeah, I mean, l- looking at it too, uh, Blake. I'll turn it over to you. I don't want to forget about you. I know I can't quite see unless I look yeah, on the <laughs> screen off to the <laughs> side. But <laughs> not forgetting about you, honestly, I feel like the biggest addition might have been at at the running back position going over to Quinshawn Judkin, bringing him in from Ole Miss. Yeah, man, uh, very talented back. Uh, he's actually from uh, Pike Road, which is about 30 minutes from Auburn, uh, and huh. Auburn uh, didn't recruit him, the Brian Harson era. So uh, he ended up going to Ole Miss, being freshman of the year over there in the SEC. And, uh, man, I'll, I'll tell you what, getting him uh, – is I think that could ease things for, for Will Howard. I think he could be that workload kind of guy. Uh, you're going to have a two-back system there, uh, and I think it could make life much easier for Will Howard. Uh, now, I know Quinshawn had some things at Ole Miss last year. They said that in the middle of the season he was kind of a distraction. There was things where uh, the attitude got in the way, the, the uh, NIL – you know, all this and him and Jackson Dart didn't see eye to eye on the field at times. Is that going to carry over to Ohio State? You got to you got to put down the attitude and uh, you're in a you're at a place now that expects to win national championships. You're not at Ole Miss anymore who hopes to go to Atlanta in the SEC championship. You're at a place now where it's national championship or bust. So that's what I'm interested to see with Quinshawn Jenkins. Yeah, and I feel like you're right, too. Ole Miss is one of those places where, you know, you go that nine-win season, you're okay with that as an Ole Miss fan. Uh, you wish you could have had more. Maybe ten-win season, you're feeling really good about yourself. Um, but, Jeremy, looking over here at Ohio State, one thing that I know you're going to want to bring up is uh, you're not going to be able to gawk over Marvin Harrison Jr. at Ohio State anymore. That is true. Um, although – I'm never going to question their wide receiver room, uh, no. but they didn't add any big pieces in. Uh, I did see they got a pretty good uh, recruit out of Jeremiah Smith, a uh, wide receiver that came in. But uh, overall, I mean, what, what are you looking at here with this this Ohio State team? How are you feeling in the Big Ten for them? I mean, looking at the Big Ten for Ohio State, you look at 
what everyone said. The biggest thing that they can't get past is Michigan. But mm. in this new aspect, we don't have to worry about that factor anymore. You can still make the playoffs, and you can still win a national championship in this situation. But you look at everything for what they did last year. It was a good season. Don't get me wrong. They had their ups and their downs per season. They had plenty of games to where you see them strive from the first snap of the game, and you see them where it seems like they're not right there out the get-go, but after halftime, they make those proper adjustments like what you see for most of these teams, and then they finally get their ball going. But looking at their depth chart, obviously, they're, it, you don't have to say anything really much about Ohio State. Yeah, they did add some some players here in the situation, but obviously you look at the roster that they have now, like Jaden Ballard and Nolan Bado and um, – Amika Abuka, obviously. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, still there. Yeah, he's I mean, still it's... there. I mean, you look at these guys. I mean, they have plenty of depth in this situation. This is a team that obviously everyone fears every single year. So realistically, in my opinion, Josh, I still think Ohio State's obviously going to be that top dog team, and you're still going to have to worry about Ohio State regardless for the situation for this upcoming season. Yeah, I feel like really early in the offseason, they kind of – put that footprint in the, you know, kind of knock that door open that they might be the top team to, yeah. to really kind of having to, having to reckon with uh, there in the Big Ten and just nationally. Um, but jumping on, I guess, did you guys have anything else on, on Ohio State? Nothing? No. Oh. Don't want to take anything away from anyone, so please no. interrupt me if I'm going too fast. No. Oh, yeah. but let's jump on to Oregon, uh, a new team. Very weird to say that that's a Big Ten team, <laughs> but Oregon going to be a Big Ten team in just two seasons as head coach. Dan Landing has really established himself as one of the best college football head coaches in the nation. Um, and he, he's, his team has had a 22-5 and five record, back-to-back -back bowl victories. Uh, and with the Ducks moving into the Big Ten, Dan Landing has really focused on building a physical team on both sides of the ball. And he's really known for that. He's known for being a physical guy. He's, he came up, <laughs> up from uh, under uh, Kirby, Kirby Smart. Smart. So, you know, looking at where he came from, obviously that's what he's focusing on. Uh, and so getting that, that physical team put together, that physical defense that we know that Dan Lanning is capable of putting together, uh, and I, I have no doubts, especially when looking at some of the other guys that they've gotten for their defense as well. Um, but one of the best, best defenses in the Pac-12 last year, moving to the Big Ten, I think it's going to be a really good transition for them into this new conference. Um, starting off, I'll kind of go down some of the notable portal additions. That's, that's really where I think they attacked the most. Uh, not as much with recruiting, but they still got some good recruits, not saying that they didn't. Um, QB Dylan Gabriel uh, coming from my Oklahoma Sooners. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see what he's able to do there. Uh, I'm, I'm a little... I'm, I'm, Are you I'm, skeptical about it? No, not skeptical. I'm just kind of on the fence because I feel like I, I don't like the fact that guys can transfer multiple times, but I hope the best for him, and I think this can be a good opportunity for him. Um, but they also got Dante Moore from UCLA, which was kind of confusing to me, but having him transfer in as well, uh, he, I don't think he had really any playing time, uh, not any notable playing time. And uh, he's, he's supposed to be a really good QB, too. So maybe he can learn under Dylan Gabriel and kind of open the door for him and open it for, for bigger things. Uh, you've also got wide receiver Evan Stewart coming in from Texas A&M. Uh, Tez Johnson from Troy, another receiver. And then over on that defensive side, you've got safety Kobe Savage from uh, K-State. I think his last name says enough about him. Uh, and then you've also got a cornerback, uh, Cam Alexander from UTSA, and then also cornerback uh, Jabbar Muhammad from Washington which a little weird that you transfer over to your rival team, but I won't say anything about that. But Oregon's passing defense, they led the Pac-12 last season with only allowing uh, 215, almost 216 yards per game. Uh, I think these additions to the defense is really going to help. One of the best passing defenses mm -hmm. uh, in the Pac-12. But, I mean, Ravi, an Oregon team, how do you think they're going to fare their first year in the Big Ten? Yeah, they're, they're an interesting case because I, I do think they're probably built the best in order to make the transition from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten out of any of those teams. I mean, I think, uh, again, I know we'll get to them, but even though Washington was better last year, I think they're really going to struggle with all the changes they went through. Um, there are some pieces that, I, that I'm interested to see, though, with uh, Oregon, specifically in the middle of that defense with Harmon mm -hmm. and Caldwell. I anticipate kind of anchoring that defensive line. I think that's going to be really crucial. You mentioned their pass defense. I do wonder how they're going to hold up with two new defensive linemen in the Big Ten, where that's probably going to be uh, something that they're going to have to focus on quite a bit more um, than they did in the Pac-12, just stylistically with the teams they're going to play. So that's going to be really interesting for me. They do have a lot of new pieces on defense, so I'm curious how long it's going to take for them to kind of settle in there. Um, but Dan Lanning's incredible. I, I'm a yeah. huge fan. I It was a huge win for them for him not to go to Alabama mm -hmm. um, or ha to have no interest in Alabama. 
And long term, I really like their prospects in the Big Ten. I'm a little interested to see what, like you are with Dylan Gabriel, what that situation is going to look like with him and Dante Moore. Um, I, I imagine it's going to be Gabriel, but, yeah. you know, they brought in Dante Moore for a reason, and yeah. I don't know what that reason is yet. Yeah. And so that's going to be really interesting to me. But uh, I would I would guess if somebody's going to challenge Ohio State for supremacy in the Big Ten, it's going to be Oregon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, sure. when you're looking through the Big Ten, they seem like they've got the, the most, I guess, really the highest chance to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, yeah, with Dylan Gabriel, I think one thing that I could see is maybe maybe the Oregon coaching staff had a little bit of a question mark uh, you know, with looking back at Dylan Gabriel, looking back at UCF days, uh, how much time he lost there from an injury and then his first year at Oklahoma, getting that big concussion, which really set Oklahoma back a lot uh, and, and getting killed by Texas, uh, getting killed by TCU. Um, so, you know, with, with that, I think that could have been maybe maybe yeah. a back thought thinking about insurance policy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, maybe put a little bit of insurance on top of that. He's Dante Moore is a young guy. Yeah. He's got he's, he's got young. time to sit behind uh, Gabriel and kind of move his way in. Um, but Blake. I know you're a big Oregon fan on top of your being an Auburn fan. So <laughs> yeah. how, how you well, feeling about your Oregon Ducks moving their way in? Well, Bo moved on, uh, and he is, now, <laughs> uh, he is now with the Denver Broncos. So I guess I, I got to pull for the Broncos now on Sundays. But, you're uh, a Broncos fan now. Huh? So you're a Broncos fan now. I know what to get yeah, you for Christmas. Yeah, man, I, I'm, I'm actually uh, putting together a trip to fly out to Denver to – to watch him this year like I did last year at Oregon and everything. So, um, yeah, look, Oregon moving to the Big Ten is actually a blessing to me. Uh, I think it's going to benefit that program uh, mm -hmm. in really, really uh, good ways. I, I think it's going to help their recruiting. Uh, just because the Pac-12 had fallen off a cliff. I mean, it, it, they were they were killing it in the in the Pac-12. But I think moving into the Big Ten, uh, you're going to actually – you're going to have kids uh, want to flock to play for you in the trenches and everything. And uh, I know Dan Lanning is building that program up like an SEC powerhouse, uh, and, and that's really his goal. That's what he said when he went to Oregon is he wanted to take the Southern kids out to the West Coast and, uh, and build something that Kirby Smart had. So my biggest thing with Oregon, the question mark, is Dylan Gabriel, can he stay healthy? Uh, I do like the move from Dante Moore. Uh, coming in, uh, sitting, learning from Dylan, a guy that's played a lot of college football. Uh, you sit, you learn, and then next year you got two years to play, uh, and, and you take over that program, and, uh, and you run it. So, Look, you lost Bucky Irvin, uh, but you still, got, uh, you still got Jordan James. He's a, he's a nice back. Um, and, and then I love Jabbar Muhammad coming over from Washington. I think that's a, a, a heck of a piece there uh, in that secondary. So th they're going to have talent. They're going to have talent. I think the biggest thing uh, for Oregon's schedule is you get Ohio State in Autzen. Yeah. That's that's the big one is you get the Buckeyes in Autzen. Uh, that's going to be probably going to be game day. Uh, it's going to be an electric atmosphere. Autzen is uh, – just a madhouse man it is electric if if uh, anybody listening nebraska fans whatever if you get the chance to go to autzen make it happen it's an unbelievable trip um but i i think dan's gonna eventually win a i think he's gonna break the curse at oregon and i think he's gonna win a national championship uh, in the coming years i do man i do i really do i, I think he is that good uh, if he'll just stop going for it on fourth down uh, in Husky <laughs> Stadium, uh, you know, uh, that really killed him last year. But uh, he I do. I feeling DeBoer anymore, yeah, so maybe maybe he'll be all right. <laughs> well, uh, look, I, I I think he is a, a heck of a coach. Uh, like y'all said about him not going to Alabama, I think that's huge. I don't think Phil Knight's gonna let him leave Oregon. Uh, as long as Nike has anything to do with it, I think they're going to pay him whatever he wants. He seems to really love the the place up there. Their facilities are some of the best I've ever seen. Uh, it's it's a spectacular place, man, and and I'm really high on Oregon moving to the Big Ten. Yeah, and it's it's easy for him to draw kids into Oregon too, because I feel yeah, like Oregon's one of those schools that if if you're a young kid going to play college football. Uniforms mean quite a bit to you. They may yeah. not mean a whole lot when it comes down to the game of football, but it's cool. You know, you get to go rock the cool, cool uniforms. They have a new uniform every set up weekend, every week. Like. Uh, so you know, it's it's definitely a place where it's a little easier to, to kind of recruit in there. Josh, I'll t I'll tell y'all something. Uh, the better you play, uh, 
uh, the more games you win, the more Nike stuff that they get. Oh, I really? thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't realize that. Wow. Yeah, yeah the, like, the more incentive. shoes and stuff like that they get. I thought that was cool. Extra incentive. And, and plus now in the days of NIL, I'm sure you probably get even more oh, on top sure. of that. Yeah. But, Jeremy, this Oregon team having a transition into the Big Ten, what better coach to do it than Dan Landing? I mean, Dan Landing has been an unbelievable coach, like you said, for what he's been able to bring to these kids and show what true fundamental football is really about. It, it just really goes to show you what he is as a person, as a coach. But, I mean, I'm going back to a little bit like for the people at the Browning, obviously the big one, like we always talk about, Dylan Gabriel. Mm-hmm. We we got to see him play last year, and it was definitely a fun atmosphere to definitely see, especially down in Oklahoma. And unfortunately, it wasn't a night game, but still the atmosphere itself was just unbelievable. Then Dante Moore, I'm also in the same boat. I was, I'm was i waiting to see what's going to happen with Dante. That was kind of like a, a surpriser for me. Mm-hmm. I was really, really questioning about that a little bit but look evan stewart he's just been great then you look at the rest of the roster even as well like kyle casper has been a great wide receiver for oregon even looking like justice low i mean he's also another big key piece to the oregon deep ball i mean you look at these guys this is another team that has obviously got weapons and if they just keep playing like they have been they can definitely get to that next level and they can definitely easily run for a national championship, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can, I can probably agree with you. I think, I think Dan Lanning has the capability, uh, like, like you said, Blake. Yeah. Uh, I think he has the capability to bring them to prominence, and and I, I don't know. I, I, I could definitely see that in his future for sure. Uh, and and honestly, I think the biggest piece is to me when you look at their their offense, because I don't have any questions about what Dan Lanning is going to do on the defensive side of the ball. Dan Lanning just do his thing. I think he proved that when he came to an offensive league and kind of turned the entire league into. You've got to have a defense in order to stop me. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think when you when you look at what they added to their offense, I think adding both Evan Stewart and Tez Johnson over there, I think that really helps that offense out. And whoever it is that ends up being QB, I, I assume Dylan Gabriel, because the main reason why he went there was to kind of up his, his draft stock. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what Oregon's got. I think that's that's one of those teams that's really hard to root against. Uh, no matter who you cheer for, that's one of those teams. It's always fun to, to cheer for Oregon. Um, moving on to the team up north, as they would say in Ohio, uh, you're not allowed to say that name in Columbus, but we're not in Columbus. So in Michigan, the Wolverines, they're, they're not going to completely fall off a cliff, I don't think. Uh, after having to replace Jim Harbaugh, uh, he left to go to the Los Angeles Chargers following a season in which he guided his alma mater to the national championship and won it uh, and, and really just kept on rolling. Everybody thought this team's not good enough. This team doesn't have what it takes to win one more. They don't have what it takes to beat Ohio State for the third time in a row. They don't have what it takes uh, to keep on moving on. And then, you know, they get to the, the playoffs. Well, but they're not going to win a playoff game because they they just can't do it. And they're going against Alabama. You just don't beat Alabama in the playoffs. Um, but yet they, they, they prove everybody wrong. Uh, they also have to uh, – and that, that was their first national championship in 26 years. Wow. Um, so that's that's an incredible thing for that, that program – uh, to have that under their belt. And they're also going to have to replace quarterback J.J. McCarthy, uh, which I believe uh, would most likely be, uh, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank, I don't know if, Alex Orgy. Uh, Alex Orgy. Yeah, so so I, I believe he's going to be the guy that would step up uh, and do that to replace J.J. McCarthy. Uh, and most of its offensive line and several other contributors uh, are, are all gone. Uh, they lost a big part uh, of that team. And, uh, of course, losing your head coach isn't an easy thing to do. Um, but I think with them turning it over uh, to Sharon, Sharon Moore, I think that's a good uh, good way to leave it, kind of handing it off to him rather than expecting somebody else to come in and learn the culture, uh, learn what, what Michigan football is all about. He knows what it's about. Uh, he, he was there with, with uh, the, the team that won the national championship. He was a big part of it. In fact, he, he actually played that role as a head coach. Uh, and so having to take over whenever there was all kinds of uh, kind of, kind of rulings against uh, uh, Harbaugh and everything there in Michigan. But uh, looking over, I, the one thing when I was looking at Michigan is I wasn't super impressed. I, I don't think I've ever really been impressed with their recruiting. I don't think they recruit super well, which is kind of hard to do when you, you've got academic uh, standards the way that they do. Yeah. Um, but then on top of that, they, you know, Jim Harbaugh didn't like to go to the transfer portal very much. He wanted to build within and kind of develop guys, which – it worked for him. You can't you can't argue can't against the guy that. whenever he keeps on winning. Uh, and then his last year there wins the national championship. But they did bring in a linebacker from Maryland, uh, Jay Sean Barham. So I do think he's he's a really good addition. 
Uh, we, we talked about maybe not even talking about too much about Maryland, but I'll bring him up. One of the one of the key pieces over there that made Maryland as good as they were. Uh, also bring in an offensive lineman, which I think they really need, uh, especially, like I said, losing basically their entire offensive line. Uh, they brought in Josh uh, Preeb, I believe his, his name is, from Northwestern, a big guy. Uh, so bringing him at they, they, they do have some big recruits to mention. They've got a running back named Jordan Marshall that came in, uh, a QB named Jaden da- uh, Jaden Davis. I almost said Daniels. Um, Jaden Davis, uh, four star. He was from the 2023 class, but he's kind of sitting back there. Like I said, I, I assume that Alex Orgy's going to step in, but you've got him there sitting on the bench learning. Uh, and and you know he was able to learn from JJ last year. Now being able to to learn from Alex this year, I think that's going to be uh, you know good for him to kind of develop himself. Um, and then they've also got a tight end, Brady. Uh, not even sure how to say his last name. Price 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 Corn. Price Corn. Uh, also a four star tight end. Uh, so bringing in some big guys, I've, I've heard some big things, you know, looking, looking through and reading and hearing, hearing people talk about him. Uh, I do think Colston Loveland is the tight end uh, number one there. But if you're going to put in maybe a two tight end package, he might see some playing time. Um, but the big thing is, is that uh, Colston Loveland is going to probably be going off to the NFL after this, uh, this next season because he'll be a junior. Right. So, you know, you've, you've got to see maybe he'll get some playing time, but most likely – in the future, that might be a tight end to look at. Um, but overall, I, I think this is going to be a totally different Michigan team. It's kind of crazy to see a, a team win a national championship and then literally lose, lose everybody. everything. Um, but uh, Robbie, how you feeling about Michigan, who's usually at the top of the top of the Big Ten? Yeah, I think we're going to see kind of them revert to the pre three year run that they had with Harbaugh. You know, before I don't really count COVID because that was a weird year for everybody. Yeah, yeah, but no 2019 and before, they were kind of living in that 8-9 win range quite a bit. And I think they're going to return back. I don't think they're going to be bad by any means. <laughs> but, you know, you look at the quarterback spot in particular. Like, J.J. McCarthy was the thing that took them from not good enough. Like, you, Kate McNamara made uh, a college football playoff, right? Like, yeah. they, went under, they, they had that uh, great season under Kate McNamara. They couldn't get over the top with him, right? J.J. Right. McCarthy was the difference maker between – being a really good football team and being a national champion. And with J.J. McCarthy gone, you've got a bunch of guys that haven't played hardly any football. Yeah. Whether it's Alex Orgy, even though he's been there two or three, I think he's a retro sophomore, so this is yeah. his third year he's been in the program. Uh, he didn't throw a pass last year. No. Had no. a handful of rushing attempts. Uh, you mentioned uh, Davis, the freshman. Like, no matter – so it's kind of funny. You know, like, Davis doesn't have significantly less playing time than the guy that we project as their starter in Alex yeah. Orgy. Um, so that's a huge question mark for me is just what happens there because we've seen what these teams look like when they've got a difference maker at quarterback when they or when they've got just a dude. I like to call them kind of just Iowa quarterbacks, right? Cause, yeah. And that's where Cade McNamara ends up. Like the guy that doesn't have to do too much something. other than stand back there and take the yeah, snap. Yeah, <laughs> just like don't put it in the ditch, man. Just don't put it in the ditch and we'll be fine. Like that's what they had a quarterback prior to J.J. McCarthy. And this is kind of who they were, 8-9 wins. Well, it's funny that you say that because he's literally an Iowa quarterback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. literally. <laughs> it's the, it, was a, it was a match made in heaven. You yeah. know, like he's just a dude, right? And that's kind of where that's kind of where I see this whole crop of quarterbacks for Michigan. And like you mentioned, they lost a ton of guys at really key spots. Offensive line, they, they, they're missing some guys on defense as well. Like it's a – it's a, it's a, I don't want to say a total rebuild, but like they're replacing Pretty a close. ton of dudes. And as you mentioned – they don't have these crazy recruiting classes. Yeah, you know yeah. they're always top twenty. Sometimes they creep into that top fifteen, but they didn't have a top ten class in the five years before winning a national title, which is basically unheard of. Yeah, and so they don't have this stockpile like an Alabama or a Georgia does, where you're just plugging and playing five stars at every position every time you lose a guy. And they didn't go aggressively into the portal either. So you're looking at this and you go, I think they're pretty good. Yeah. I think but that's about it. I, I, I can't really say they're not going to be good, but I don't have any reason to believe they're going to be great. I will say I think they, I, I think they're going to get what they sort of ask for when they hired more instead of going outside for a candidate, and that's sort of the safe hire, right? Mm-hmm. They, I think they were so freaked out about all the bad hires before Harbaugh that they're like, let's just try and keep this thing going with a guy that was on staff and Sharon Moore, and and I get that desire, but. When you're in a position like Michigan, you could have hired just about anybody in the country. Like, yeah, yeah. You would have been in the conversation for, like, Kalen DeBoer might have taken that job over Alabama because he's a Midwest guy. Like, I wouldn't have shocked me if he would have, if Kalen DeBoer would have gone Michigan if that job was available and open to him over in Alabama. Yeah. That's kind of 
geographically where he's been most of his life outside of his division one head coaching jobs well, and it's it's pro probably a little easier to take over for jim harbaugh than nick saban yeah, yeah. <laughs> like jim, jim harbaugh just did a great thing don't don't want to take anything away from him versus probably the greatest college football yeah. coach of all time right like Kalen DeBoer is probably going to get fired at Alabama at some point just for not being Nick Saban. Yeah. Yeah. Like he could be incredible and he's going to get fired for not being Nick Saban, right? Jerome Moore is in a really good spot in yeah. terms of expectations, but I, I think Michigan maybe missed an opportunity to elevate their program in a way that I don't know that Sharon Moore can. Maybe he can. Maybe he's a great head coach, but yeah. we don't know. They could have gotten a guy with a track record, though, because it's Michigan and I think they missed an opportunity there. Yeah, and I, I think I think Sharon Moore gets a lot of credit for something you know that was kind of handed to him whenever he whenever Harbaugh was out, because it's not like Harbaugh wasn't on campus during practices. It wasn't like Harbaugh had no communication with the team. He was still there. Um, but Blake, how you feeling about this kind of new Michigan Wolverines team in the Big Ten? I think if they win eight games, that's a, a, a huge success. Uh, I think if if they get to eight and four, just because of everything they lost, man, like, and it's tough. You're you're gonna have the national championship hangover. Uh, you lost JJ and your your team leader, your guy, uh, and then one of my favorite is is uh, Roman Wilson. You lost him on the outside. He was a chain mover, man, and at big third downs, uh, he always you know he always connected with JJ and. And I moved the sticks, and, and you lose him, and then you lose Blake Corum, one of the best running backs in the country. Uh, I just, with everything they lost, I don't know how you overcome that. And, and then you have to deal with Penn State, who's bringing back a uh, majority of their roster. You know, you, you got uh, Ohio State. And, I mean, the, the Big Ten is going to be pretty – pretty fun to watch this year you know you, you like Oregon coming over USC coming in Lincoln Riley you know he's going to want to put up points so it's 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 an even tougher league now and you lose all of this I just think if you win eight games if coach Moore wins eight games it's got to be a success uh after everything you lost and uh I want to shout out Will Johnson for not transferring though uh yeah. I think I think that was A plus, man, because he could have went anywhere in the country. Uh, he could have went to Alabama with the safety that Michigan had go down there, uh, and he chose to stay. He chose to stay. So shout out to him in a in a world in college football where you lose a coach and everybody transfers. I kind of think that's why Michigan chose to go uh, with Sharon Moore is because they didn't want to lose everything. Yeah. So they said, "Hey, let's keep." Let's keep our guy in house, so we don't just absolutely lose the entire roster and have to start over like Washington did. Man, like Washington lost everybody. Like, yeah. I mean, they lost all their coaches. Their their players were transferred. Like Muhammad, he transferred uh, a couple hours down south to Oregon. You know, so it's it's. I, I think that's kind of why they went that route, but I just don't think it's going to be uh, 10, 11, 12 wins college football playoff worthy this year. I really don't. Well, and, and let's be honest. Do you think Harbaugh was going to win the 10, 11, 10 or 11 ga games this upcoming season after losing as much as he lost? I, th I think he had, a, I think he would have, I think he'd have been competitive. He's I think that good. A nine, 10 win, uh, not necessarily a 10, 11. Yeah, yeah, that that have been in the that have been in the college football playoff hunt. I don't know if they would have made it. Yeah, uh, but he's that good. Yeah, but Jeremy, uh, it's a it's a totally different Wolverines team uh, this year in the Big Ten. Yeah, it's definitely going to be weird not seeing JJ and Blake Corum because Blake Corum was definitely one of those big key players that you can just rely on. Obviously, during the last last season when their linemen went down, then I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but then obviously the. After the everything that I encountered when they got him off the field, then they got everything going again. Then the first first play they did running into the end zone. Blake Corum is one of those guys that has such a big heart and he plays like an absolute animal. And obviously you can tell now we can see why he's gonna do in the NFL. I mean, you look at the rest of the roster, that's what I'm really curious for is for the Michigan offense. Obviously, the quarterback position, obviously, like you said, JJ McCarthy's not there anymore. Blake Corum's not there anymore. But my big thing is I feel like the 
understand him, find a really good quarterback from Michigan, obviously, run their next step up. My big thing is is for their running situation. Now, I, like I said, Blake Corm's not there, but now I feel like they're really going to have to rely a lot on, like, TVR Dunlap or even, like, Donovan Edwards, obviously, for their running situation. And even um, – Benjamin Hall, I feel like he's going to get some reps in. Obviously, he's a freshman, but still, with what he's able to do, I've seen some stats on him, and he's been he's shown a lot of surprise for what he's able to do for the Michigan Wolverines. So, looking at it, but I mean, you look at their schedule also for what they have. Obviously, with Fresno, the start with Texas, then USC and Minnesota. Well, Texas then, in the big house too. Yeah, right? in the big that's, house. That's that's exciting. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. Then obviously Washington, Illinois, Michigan State, Oregon, Indiana, Northwestern. Then obviously round out the season with Ohio State. But you look at this; it's going to be a tough road for them Wolverines. I mean, I I can see them maybe winning seven games this year. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's going to be, be tough. It's going to be a different year it's for them. Be they're hard. they're going to have to come from way up here and be knocked. <laughs> Far down. Yeah, they were here. Now this it's back to, season. back to even, so they got to figure out everything. But it's it's kind of shocking to me that Michigan's like the third favorite to win the Big Ten Which with losing as much as they've lost. It's crazy. Uh, completely new regime and everything. Yeah. Um, but jumping over to Penn State, we'll jump down to them, the Nittany Lions. Uh, we, we talked about Ohio State and Oregon. Somebody's got to, got to challenge those two teams from running the Big Ten. Uh, and with Washington kind of rebuilding, Michigan kind of going through this process, Penn State feels like they're the team that would be the challenge. Uh, in the Big Ten, uh, the Nittany Lions have struggled to score against good teams, uh, and you know, Coach James Franklin, uh, he, he's he's had some struggles on offense. So he hires uh, the Kansas offensive coordinator Andy, Andy uh, Kotelnik, Kotelnicki, uh, and so he he gets him to boost their passing game a little bit. Which that passing game from from Penn State ranked 80th in the FBS with 215 yards per game last year. Uh, and this is from this is a, you know a team that has. Uh, Drew Aller in, in at quarterback, who they had high expectations from. Um, so looking at this this Penn State team, definitely kind of struggled. Uh, they're they're very high on Drew Aller, uh, and they're going to still have Nick Singleton. They're still going to have Katrin Allen, uh, which are nice players to have around uh, Drew Aller for sure. Um, but the receiving room is a little thin uh, yeah. when you, when you look at that receiving room. Uh, they lost uh, Keandre Lambert Smith, uh, so they're not going to have him around to p- pass the ball to. So with without him. Uh, what, what do they do? Of course, they pick up Ohio State transfer uh, Julian Fleming, which I think was a really good pickup uh, going out and getting him. I think if you're going to get a wide receiver from any team in the nation, Ohio State's probably a pretty good one to go for. Yeah, you think? Um, and, and, so, and then they, they also get uh, Jalen Kimber from Florida, A.J. Harris from Georgia, uh, really trying to, to battle to replace uh, the, the cornerback, Kalen King. And then there was also uh, Johnny Dixon, who they lost in the spring. Um, so, you know, getting those two guys from the SEC, bringing them over, um, big tough guys that are going to be able to play uh, in, in the uh, secondary pretty well. Uh, they, they also have a, a tight end recruit, five-star Luke Reynolds, uh, who they bring in. I think that was a really good recruit for them to bring in, kind of add to that that passing attack to, a little bit. Uh, and then, you know, just overall, it's going to be a new new offense for sure, uh, looking looking at what Penn State's got. But, uh, Robbie, how are you feeling about Penn State this year? Yeah, I mean, on paper, they seem like the most likely team to challenge uh, Oregon and Ohio State. Uh, frankly, I just don't trust James Franklin. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I yeah. just, I, yeah. I think they're probably going to win nine or ten games like they always do and lose the games that matter <laughs> and end up in a, in a frustrating spot that they have been with their fan base for the last few years, right? Every time they have an, have an opportunity to break through, they seem to fall short, whether it gets Michigan, Ohio State, whoever the case is they tend to really struggle uh, in these games that matter. And I don't have any, until that happens, I don't have any reason to believe that's going to change. And, you know, people look at, at Aller and, and think, oh, well, he's, you know, he was this highly rated recruit and he's coming back and, you know, their offense is going to be great. But the stats you just mentioned, like bottom third of the country in passing offense last yeah. year, I don't know why we're freaking out that Drew Aller's coming back. Like, and as you mentioned, they've, they've got some holes to fill and hopefully Julian Fleming uh, is able to perform for them. But, you know, like I said, on paper, they make a lot of sense. In practicality, I don't totally trust what they're going to march out there. Um, the other thing that I think we have to acknowledge, too, is, and I don't know that it's going to go this way, but with the news this week about James Franklin kind of being in some hot water with some of the influencing medical decisions that he was alleged to have done, like there's a chance we're talking about a totally different thing by the time August rolls around. I mean, we're three full months away from the season starting, and I'm not 
you know, like this is what Bill Cuba got fired for at Illinois. Now they didn't like Bill Cuba anyway. No, it was just like who liked him. But if there's any chance that Penn State's like, ah, we don't totally love the money that we've got guaranteed because it seems like every time a job comes up, James Franklin squeezes a new contract out of us. Like this is an opportunity for them to be like, ah, oh, maybe we part ways here because he would get fired for cause for something like this if you're influencing medical decisions of the of the staff. I don't know if it's going to get there, but it is something that I'm keeping an eye on because. I don't know what this looks like three months from now. I don't know what the reports are going to be three months from now. What I do know is even if he is there, I don't love what he's done when he's had to get big wins uh, at Penn State. It just hasn't happened. So, again, on paper, you go, hey, maybe it's Ohio State, Oregon, and Penn State. For me, yeah, they're probably going to have a good season. I don't think they're going to challenge for anything. They'll, yeah. they'll be in the hunt. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm just yeah, like they always are. I'm, they, oh, yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm looking at their, their schedule, too. I feel like their schedule is easy enough. Uh, yeah. You know, you've got – uh, you know, starting off week one is kind of a, a, a scary one for you. Cause I believe that's at West Virginia. Uh, that's, that's mm -hmm. one of those games you don't want to write off week one. Uh, it's, 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 it's a fresh season for both teams. You're going into their, their hostile environment. Uh, and then of course you've got Bowling uh, Green at and... USC at Wisconsin at Ohio or no, uh, Ohio state at home. So I, I assume that's probably going to be, uh, the whiteout game, but mm -hmm. that, that three game stretch is, is the hardest, uh, three game stretch of their season. But, uh, Blake, how are you feeling about this Penn State team? Well, I can tell you uh, the way I look at it is Keandre Lambert-Smith chose to play with Peyton Thorne over Drew Eiler. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So, Nothing so, uh, yeah, you know, I'm I'm with y'all on the I'm not I'm just not hyped up about the Drew Eiler and I, I watched him last year. I do think Penn State can lean on their backfield, uh, but. I mean, you got to have a quarterback, man. Like, like we saw Michigan lean on their backfield, but we also saw J.J. McCarthy step up in the Rose Bowl against Alabama and deliver on third down uh, and lead his team to victory uh, down the field on the on that final drive. So you got to have that guy under center, and I just don't think Penn State has that. And I'm with y'all on uh, James Franklin. I don't think he's the guy. I, I don't. I, I think he is uh, Mr. Mediocre. I think he is, uh, you know, just that guy that uh, he he can flirt. You know, he can flirt with the girl at school, but he can never close the deal, man. Uh, <laughs> he 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 flirts, uh, but when he asks her out, he gets denied. And so, uh, it's just he's not the guy. And, and Ohio State, they get Ohio State at home. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, uh, that's that's the biggest thing for them. They, 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 they've got going in that game. You, uh, you, you remember you remember what happened two years ago when they had Ohio State at home? Hmm. It come down to like the final possession, and uh, and C.J. Stroud just just I mean ended them like like all the hype was with Penn State. They were oh Penn State's going to win the Big Ten. C.J. Stroud said hey no thanks like not going to happen. Uh, I, I, they're just. It, look, it's hard for me to say a whole lot about them because they waxed us two years in a row, uh, <laughs> and the potato famine uh, was was thriving at Auburn, right? Uh, so I, they're just that that program that's nine, ten wins. Uh, they'll go to a New Year's Six bowl. That's a heck of a season, uh, and I just I'm not a believer in Drew Aller. And and hey, great offensive, uh, great offensive coordinator hire. Like ran a yeah. heck of an offense at Kansas. Uh, but I just don't think you got the signal caller to elevate you to the college football playoff. Yeah, and, and uh, Jeremy, what's what's crazy about Drew Aller is that whenever he stepped in for Sean Clifford, everyone saw what he was capable of doing. He stepped in a couple of times when when Sean Clifford would go down, uh, and he looked like the real deal. Not not quite the same look now that he is the guy. Yeah, I think now that the spotlight's on him, I think it's going to be a complete different situation. Like like you mentioned, when he gets those moments to where he's going to step in, then he makes the clutch situations and he makes good ideas and good plays and good reads. I understand that, but you have to understand you have to do that night in and night out one play at a time here. Mm -hmm. This isn't a one and done situation here. You have to play four full quarters of this and you have to, you will soon realize to what college football is truly all about. And you'll find out what Penn State's really meaning into. Like you look at this team from what they did last year for rushing yards that a little over 2000 yards for rushing yards. Like, Per rushing attempts, they were averaging maybe close to five yards. This is a situation to where you look at this Penn State team, and I'm thinking they they didn't just – like, don't get me wrong. Penn State's a really good football team here. 
But this is a moment to where they need to definitely step up and they need to realize we lost some pieces here. We lost a lot. But now that now that the time has come, it's getting close to the season here. We have to really look at these players and really reevaluate who's going to be the next starting guy in this situation. But looking at it, like my big thing is for like running back situations, they're going to have to they're going to have to really find something like Trey Potts. He's he's a senior this year up in Pennsylvania, but even another guy like Emil Davis, like mm-hmm. he's he's a sophomore if I if I remember correctly, but. These guys, they have definitely got to step up, and they got to step up fast because August is going to be coming around fast, and they got to they got to find the right thing to do here. Yeah, absolutely. A big question mark for Penn State. We'll see what they're able to put together if they're able to be as good as they they should be, as 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 many of us would believe that they should be. Um, but let's go ahead and move over to USC real quick. I don't have a whole lot to say about them. They lost Caleb Williams. I think that's yeah. a big loss for them. But uh, I, I think I don't think. They're going to have too many, uh, you know, problems there. I think they've got a, a coach that's pretty good at, at putting together quarterbacks over there. I think so. um, but the big thing with U- USC, especially coming into the Big Ten, and uh, you know, Blake, Jeremy, we've talked about this over and over again, is that defense. Uh, and that's the, the only reason why it was kind of a sigh of relief that Lincoln Riley left Oklahoma yeah. uh, was that at least we maybe, you know, we we pull on a, a better defense and look at that we did. Yeah. Um, but you know, you look at what they did on on the defensive side of the thing. They brought in two safeties. They've got. Uh, Akili Arnold from Oregon State, uh, and then also Kamari Ramsey from UCLA. They bring in a couple of cornerbacks. They got John Humphrey from UCLA as well, uh, and then another cornerback, uh, DeCarlos Nicholson from Mississippi State. And then you've got a D lineman, Nate Clifton from Vanderbilt, uh, and then a linebacker, Easton uh, uh, Arnold you know, from Oregon State. So you've got some guys that you add to that defense that helps kind of push that over the top. On top of that, you also get rid of Alex Grinch, who was never going to get it done there, uh, and they hire uh, DeAnton Lynn. Uh, from UCLA. So bringing him over, I don't know if that was the right move, but I'm not really sure who was on the table for him. Um, but uh, Ravi, looking over at U- USC, do you think they're going to have the defense to be able to stand in the Big Ten? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I don't. I also, I mean, you're, you're filling a lot of spots with with transfers and, yeah. and guys that are, are going to be playing together for the first time. Um, I do think Anthony Lynn was a good hire as a defensive coordinator, but um, I, I just don't know when you're working, w- unless Lincoln Riley's willing to play complimentary football with his defensive coordinator, I don't know that it matters who that guy is. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. You know, um, Tony White was up for that job from Nebraska. And I think one of the conversations that was uh, Matt Rule likely had with him, because he didn't really say, say this directly, but he's like, hey, if you're going to take a job, make sure you take the right job, right? It's not about making sure you never move on, but it's making sure you move on a place where you can be successful. I feel like going to be... Lincoln Riley's defensive coordinator is not a place you're going to go be successful. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Best case scenario, you're going to a place where you're hoping it's not a disaster. And that's what it's been. That's what it was with Alex Grinch. And with this many moving pieces and guys coming in, at least at the start of the year, I imagine it's not going to be a m- much better with Anthony Lynn. The other thing that I'm worried about if, if I'm USC is stylistically, I don't know how this plays in the Big Ten offensively without a guy like Caleb Williams, yeah. right? Like Caleb Williams covered a multitude of problems for USC. They weren't a good football team last no, year. Not right? Like no. full stop. They had a terrible offensive line. They have good skill position players, but Caleb Williams is the only reason they were even functional last year as a football team. Now you're asking either what Miller Moss or uh, Jaden Maiava, mm-hmm. the, 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 uh, the transfer guy coming in, like to all of a sudden be Caleb Williams I, I don't think we're appreciating how special Caleb Williams was last yeah. year. Or and listen, I get it. Every time, everywhere he's gone, he's turned some quarterback into a Heisman Trophy winner, number one draft pick. I get it. But as soon as that stops, because it will eventually, right? There's going to be some time where he's not not going to have. I mean, we saw it with Spencer Rattler a little bit there, mm-hmm. right? Where you're like, yeah, that doesn't quite look the way we wanted it to. And then Caleb Williams comes in. If you're in a situation like that and you don't have Caleb Williams behind whoever Miller Moss or whoever else, you're sitting there and you end up with a super mediocre football team at best. You look at this team stylistically, if they're not able to hang in the Big Big Ten and they don't have that guy at quarterback, they could legitimately be in some trouble. Like I look at this as a potential six or seven win team. Yeah, and they, they lost a lot too. When you, yeah. when you look at all the talent that they lost, um, you know, and this is a defense that was 121st in the FBS in scoring defense, allowing almost 35 points a game. Uh, 119th in total defense, uh, allowing 400 and almost 433 yards a game last year. Uh, it's, it's a terrible defense. But uh, Blake, 
I know we've had a lot to say about their defense. Do you think they're going to be able to get it get it together under Lincoln Riley and a new defensive coordinator? No, no, <laughs> no. He, look, uh, Lincoln don't care about defense. All right, Lincoln's going to go try to score sixty, uh, and and if he can't do it, then he's just going to take the L, man. Like he need, he just needs to be look take the Chip Kelly route. Be it go be an OC. Uh, you're not a head coach. He's just not to me. I think LSU dodged a major bullet by not hiring him. Uh, and USC wanted to make the flashy hire. They thought that this could get Matt Leinart and Reggie Bush back into the, the limelight at USC, get them back on the sidelines and all that good stuff. I just don't think he is a head coach. I don't think he cares about defense. I don't even know if they tackle at practice. All right, I went and watched Oregon and USC last year. All right, and I've never, I've never witnessed such poor tackling in my life. It, it's 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 terrible. It's is it awful. Like a football game bad or <laughs> it, 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 look, it's, it might be worse. All right, it, it it was terrible. The only the only bright spot they had was Caleb, and I'm telling you right now, uh, like y'all said, he covered up a lot of bad bad things in that in that program. All right, uh. Watching that dude play live, like it looks great on TV, but watching him live and in person, dude's freaky. All right, it's freaky, and I am uh, I'm a big fan of Caleb. I'm just not a big fan of Lincoln, and I don't care if Miller Moss threw for six touchdowns in a bowl game uh, where 34 people were sitting out for whoever they played and all this stuff. I don't care. Uh, they're not going to be. They're they're not going to be good in the Big Ten this year. They're just I no. think I think if they win six games, man, like that, I, I just I'm not a, I'm not in on Lincoln. I'm just not. I don't think he's a head coach. Yeah, and I I put most of the defensive blame on the defensive coordinators that he's always had. Uh, Alex Grinch being one of the one worst, of um, but. On top of that, like you mentioned, Robbie, he doesn't complement that defense. And Jeremy, that's that's really where I think uh, USC's biggest downfall is. What was your first? What was your first guess on that aspect? <laughs> I mean, you look at what everything had encountered for USC for last season. It was a dumpster fire for their defense. I mean, you can't you can't mean to tell me that these guys don't know how to tackle. Like it just seemed like every situation where they get a simple run play, it just seems like it goes yard. I mean, you look at the situation, what do you have to do to be able to tackle? Do you have to pay each player a little more just to – or even you have to bribe them with food or whatever the situation is? I mean, I know my mom did that, and why do you think I got a lot of tackles? <laughs> but, I mean, no. looking at USC, there's so much that they could be, but they got to find the right pieces of the puzzle here. Like, I understand you just lost Caleb Williams. I get that. But this is a new year for USC. You look at what they're able to do. They, Like I said, they could be such a good team here. But you look at their schedule for this upcoming year, I mean, it's not going to be easy. First game right off the bat is against LSU. I mean, I don't know what kind of a start that's going to lead to. We're getting another team that's struggling on defense. So yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe hit the over on that game. I'm, hey, LSU is going to drum them. <laughs> Coming from a guy who doesn't know what an under is, I mean, he – Literally, we need to make a button called Smash the Over. But, no, looking at the rest of our schedule, obviously LSU, Michigan, Wisconsin, Penn State, it's just going to be such a really, really rough road for these guys. And I'm going to be honest, I think they're going to win five, six games. I think a fun game on their schedule is going to be against Maryland, honestly, uh, looking through that <laughs> schedule. Um, but let's go ahead and jump on to Iowa. I know we probably don't want to talk too much about this team, but I do want to ask you guys, who do you think would have cheered louder, uh, the Iowa fans for Caitlin Clark? whenever she led their, their team to the national championship or the football fans, whenever Kirk, uh, Kirk Ferentz announced that he was going to fire Brian Ferentz's son, and finally Ooh. move on. And, and on top of that, whenever he announced that he was going to go with his new offensive quarter uh, uh, coordinator, Tim Lester's playbook, he said, he's going to, we're just going to go with it, uh, which probably a smart idea. Uh, you would I, think. I would, I would say they're probably more ecstatic that they're finally getting rid of a guy that can't even score the 21 points per game that he was, he was uh, kind of set as, as his standard. Um, but, you know, looking at, at what they've been, I mean, the, the Hawkeyes, they ranked 132nd in the FBS in scoring, only <laughs> scoring 15 and a half points per game, uh, 130th in passing uh, wow. at 118 and a half yards a game uh, last season. Somehow they still finished finished 10 and 4 
uh, and they played Michigan for a Big Ten title. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, just imagine what they can do if they can score 21 points, Robbie. Yeah, I mean, I actually think this is your likely third place team in the in the Big Ten. I think they really, really? yeah they bring back a ton of guys. Yeah, they, they do. They have a ton of experience, and if if we've learned anything about this team, it's that they are super comfortable and super efficient at winning ugly football games. <laughs> and if they can drag you into the mud, they're going to beat you there. And they're pretty successful at dragging most of these teams into the mud. And if you look at their schedule, right, you only look at a couple teams that you're like, okay, they're going to be clearly outclassed talent-wise by these teams. That's Ohio State on October 5th when they go at Ohio State. That's an L. And then you go all the way down to who else on that schedule are they clearly out-talented by? No one. Not a soul. You look at, I mean, UCLA, I'm not sold on them this year. You look at Washington, we already talked about how they're a total rebuild. And yeah. If we get to them later, like there's nobody else on that schedule, mm-hmm. right? So maybe, you know, as a Nebraska fan, like hopefully they take that second L to Nebraska, but I'm having a hard time finding less than nine wins on this schedule and very easily could get to 10. Like this is not a difficult schedule, and this is a team that has shown they can win this way and they bring almost everybody back. This is like if Oregon or Ohio State – stumble or have injuries more Oregon than Ohio State Ohio State can kind of survive the injuries if Oregon has injuries or Dylan Gabriel gets hurt and Dante Moore isn't that guy like Iowa could sneak into second place in the Big Ten and everybody's going to look around just like they did last year and be like how did they get here that's just about every year that (laughs) they make it at a a certain point you just kind of have to be like well this is how it is even Mm -hmm. if it doesn't look like I think it should even if they don't get there in a way that makes any sense to me if they keep ending up in the same spot, maybe it's me that needs to change, not them, <laughs> because they keep winning football games. And let's be honest. You read those numbers off. The offense literally cannot be any worse. Yeah. 132nd, yeah. I believe, is dead last. Can you score 16 points per game? That's all we're yeah. – just hey. like one, if, one point above. If you, get, if you get two touchdowns and a field goal, this team will win 11 games. Yeah. I swear yeah. to you. Like, yeah. it's – it's crazy how mediocre your offense can be. Well, that's that's ten and four with a very questionable loss to, to Minnesota, Minnesota too. Yeah. Yeah. Going back and looking at that, with they're, the they're ar- deal. Ar- yeah. yes, arguably an eleven win team. That's what I and mean. And not scoring. <laughs> and and one of those losses is to Michigan in the Big Ten championship game. Like, yeah. but you look at who it is. It's Michigan for crying out loud. Yeah, they won a national championship. They're supposed to lose that game. Right? Exactly. But you look at this schedule this year, and I'm like, I don't know. I can't talk myself lower than nine wins. And I, like I said. 10 or 11 seems totally on the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, Blake, what are you feeling about the, the Iowa Hawkeyes? Be careful about what you say. We are in Nebraska. <laughs> no, uh, Gary Danielson and Brad Nessler have to uh, – they're going to have to find their way to an Iowa game at 2.30 this year and watch a 3-2 to two slugfest, <laughs> and they're going to wish that they were back in the SEC immediately. Uh, but, no, nah, man, it look, Iowa um, – you just gotta have an offense. You gotta score touchdowns, and when you get in the red zone, you gotta produce six, because you got the defense year in and year out. Uh, I mean, that's that's it's all about Ferentz, and can can he make that? Can he make that move? Uh, and so, look, if Iowa can get an offense, they can uh, muster up some uh, points and produce points instead of getting into the red zone and settling for three. You know, you're gonna win a lot of football games. Um, I mean that that's just that's the program they are, right? They're just smash mouth, grind you out. Uh I will never watch an Iowa Hawkeye football game. Uh, <laughs> it's like just like college basketball either. Yeah, it's it's just it's it's slimy in the trenches, their play action. Uh and hopefully they can get away from some of that man, like twelve personnel and all that stuff. Uh spread that thing out a little bit, you know. Uh so look Iowa, a heck of a coach team. That he's done a great job in his tenure there. Um, I just I hope they can put up some points. Uh, I do think they have one of the best traditions in, in college football with the wave. Uh, I would I, w- I would like to see that stadium and see that in person. I think that'd be really cool. I'm a college football fan. Uh, I like to go see stuff like that. But um, if you know they're always going to compete in the Big Ten, they're always going to be around the top. They're always going to play. You know, in a in an outback bowl or or something, they're gonna they're gonna play that SEC team and give them fits. Uh, so that's kind of what I think of Iowa season is just you know nine wins, you know ten in in that park, you know around that ballpark, and uh, they'll go to a nice little bowl game and just like they do every year. 
Yeah. Yeah, Jeremy, uh, are you going to take over or under 21 points per game? I might have to flip a coin for that one. I don't necessarily know. but <laughs> they score 21 points a game, they might go undefeated. Hey, they, 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 they didn't lose much on defense. Yeah, they didn't lose so, much. That's, yeah, that, that's and they're incredible on special teams. That's exactly. The thing that we, yeah. we never talked about a, is they're incredible on special yeah. teams. Exactly. Their special teams is unbelievable. They It seems like they never have a never any bag of tricks for their special teams. It's always something different, and it always seems to work for their special teams. And it, it goes to show you what you can never you can never be surprised on anything for Iowa. This season, I think, is going to be a really great season for Iowa. I know a lot of people obviously say that every single year, but it doesn't really go their way, they think. But I think this sincerely is the year for Iowa. Like, I can definitely see them winning 10 games this year. Iowa has been those kind of guys, and they can just find a way to – Block out all the haters, and because it, it always goes to show you that Iowa is always a team that gets hated every single year. There's a lot of teams that obviously do, but Iowa is definitely one of them just because of a guy named Kirk Ferentz. He always gets a lot of hatred every single year, and you see a lot of these situations to where you look at the it's like a third third and five. Do you think he was going to run it, but really it's a pass? Then half the time it gets picked off and it's going the other way. But this is the year I think that it's going to be completely flip the script. And I was finally going to actually succeed and get a really good season. They can definitely do anything that they can think of. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those teams that I will never expect anything from them, and they will always exceed those expectations somehow. Yeah, um, you know, with the expectations that were never even set. Um, but let's go ahead and jump. Uh, we were going to talk about a couple more teams. I know we wanted to talk about Washington, but for time's sake, we're going to jump over and just start talking about Nebraska um, because we can't forget. You know, a team that's really an extremely interesting team. That's my, my second favorite team to root for uh, growing up in a Nebraska uh, fan household. Um, so, you know, looking at Nebraska, I mean, the fans had a little bit of a slump here recently, right? That the team uh, really since Bo Pelini, they've, they've gone 40, 43 and 63. That's 40% win percentage since firing Bo. Uh, and they've only had one winning season since then. That was with Mike Riley going nine and four in his second season. Uh, you know, there's there's a new life in Nebraska, though, because they've kind of pushed all of that behind them. They've got the, the new regime coming in. Last year felt like there was something there, even though it didn't show itself. It still felt like something was there and you could feel it in the air. You could feel it there. There, there has to be a change going. And sure enough, there in the offseason, it felt like there was a little bit of a change because you look at Nebraska last season, really, really much like uh, what you saw from Iowa, <laughs> just really struggled on offense. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and specifically, I think you look at the biggest question for them on the team, it was their offense, but specifically the QB room. Uh, and it was obvious that Jeff Sims wasn't going to uh, win games after showing that he was turnover prone in the first couple of games uh, and just turned it over at the worst possible times. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Heinrich Harburg wasn't really the guy uh, that was really going to be able to put up those those big points, you know, enough enough to win a game. Because uh, again, you're, it's it's a new era of college football. You have to score points. You have to score touchdowns when you get down there. Uh, you can't turn the ball over because the other team is going to score score points. Um, but of course, in the off season, you have the big news of the five star QB, the man that that they were they were dreaming that they could get, and it seemed very unlikely. But then closer to time, it felt like maybe he would sign. And of course, Dylan Riola comes into Nebraska, uh, and they know exactly who they want under center. I uh, know they've got they've they've got. Uh, uh, What's the what's the backup quarterbacks? Uh, Daniel Kalins. Uh, Dan, Daniel Kalins. Yeah. Thanks. You know, they, we we know that they've got him as a backup to go to, and you've got Har Harvard still in there, uh, who stuck around. I got to commend him mm -hmm. uh, for sticking around. Uh, and then, of course, you you bring in running back Dante Dowdle from Oregon, uh, who was a top ten running back in his in, in his high school class. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got a wide receiver in Jamal Banks coming in. Uh, you know, so you, you've you've got some guys, uh, and then uh, again another one, another wide receiver Isaiah uh, Nayer, given given. Uh, Dylan Riola, an, another option to go to. Uh, he came from Texas, formerly at, at Wyoming, where you saw most of his production with, with an injury last season. Um, but, you know, you, you look at this team, this team just feels different. Looking at the, at the spring game, you, you feel that there's something different. The offense was rolling, given most of the starters didn't really go in there and play, so you can't really take too much from that. But it looked like there was communication. It looked like there was an understanding. It looked like there was chemistry on offense. So this Nebraska team, I feel like they can be – a lot different than what you've seen in years past, Robbie. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's not a stretch, I think, to say that this can be an eight win football team. Yeah. And you know, I, I say that because they had five games last year. They won five, then they had five more games that were decided by one possession or less. If and they lost all five of them. If you just turn those into coin flip games, you're an eight win team. 
and the stat always pops up on the TV to, right. re to remind you as a Nebraska fan. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, it, it's, I understand this has not been something that they've been good at in recent years, but this is also only year two under Matt Rule. You can't put the Scott Frost stuff on him. You can't put the Mike Riley stuff mm -hmm. on him. And uh, I, this team actually returns a ton of guys, too. Yeah. And the only spots that they had real issues last year were wide receiver. You mentioned Jamal Banks and Isaiah Nair. They also have an incoming freshman named Ja'Cory Barney, mm -hmm. who I think is going to be really good. Um, you got second year of Malachi Coleman. I think Jalen Lloyd is going to take a huge leap this year. I'm really excited about Jalen Lloyd. You all of a sudden have some depth and options at a spot that was a, was a killer for you last year with all the injuries they went through. And then quarterback's the obvious one, right? If they had even functional quarterback play for most of last year, we're talking about a seven or eight win team. Again, those 0 and 5 turn into 2 and 3 or 3 and 2. Well, even just starting with that Colorado game, I think I think if you don't have the turnovers, which of course you can push push yeah. a lot of that on one guy, yeah. if you don't have those who. turnovers, uh, then that's a totally different game. I think that goes the other way. And Definitely. I'm not even counting Colorado in that, those five games because yeah. it ended up being a bigger margin than that. So like you look at you look at that one and you're playing with a lot of uh, a lot of leeway for a team that could have or should have had more wins than they did last year. But there, there's a couple things that I'm, I'm really excited about, in, and it's that, besides Dylan Rayola, obviously, but it's that they return a ton of production and experience on their offensive line. It's the most experienced offensive line in the Big Ten this year. Yeah. And then their defensive line, which was a little ahead of schedule last year, is back. They get Nash Hutmacher and Ty, uh, and Ty Robinson back, which was huge for them. Those are two guys that are going to kind of usher in this new class of like Riley Van Poppel and Cam Lenhart and uh, Prince Well Umana Amalin and and like Maverick Noonan and all these guys that they've got um, that were played last year were more productive were ahead of schedule last year and now they've got a year under their belt. You've got a ton of dudes on that defense. You do have to replace a Luke Reimer. You do have to um, figure out what you're doing there, but. You're talking about returning basically nine, ten-ish starters on defense, and then on offense, you plugged all the holes, all the mm -hmm. questions that you had, and then chiefly Dylan Rayola. If he is anything close to what he has looked like, uh, both in, in spring game practices and what he was in high school, I think this is an eight-win team this year. I, I think that's super reasonable. The schedule – is also very manageable, especially up front. You have five year first six at home, first four at home. This is a team that could very feasibly be seven and zero yeah. before they go play Ohio State. Like yeah. that is a really realistic path for Nebraska this year. And as long as they're even five and two in that, you're in a really good spot. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what I was going to bring up. Is that first first half of the season is is really winnable. Very uh, you know, yeah. of course, the Colorado is kind of what's going to happen. I personally. have no idea what to do. Yeah, personally, them, yeah. I don't think they're going to be good at all. I um, don't either. But I mean, uh, Blake, give give the Nebraska fans a little bit of hope here. What do you, what do you see with this this new Nebraska team and what they're able to put together? If there's one thing Nebraska can do for me, is you take the Colorado Buffaloes and you beat them by fifty. <laughs> all right. All right. Please. All right, I'm sick of hearing about them. I'm tired of it. All you right. and everyone in the state of Nebraska <laughs> and all around the world. But look, uh, look, I'm a huge Matt Rule fan. I, I think he's going to do great things in Nebraska. I'm a huge Nebraska fan. Like, I love the fan base. I think they deserve it. Uh, when, best, look, best fan base. Hey, dude, they, they pack that place out every Saturday. Not and, a doubt. Uh, with it. I, I, I'm, I got mad respect for them, like all the sellouts and, and just uh, how they've been down for a little while and they still show up and show out for their team. Uh, passionate fans, that's why I love them so much. And, and I want college football fans to know that college football is better when Nebraska is in the competition, man. When they're in the race, when they're around it, when they're winning 10 games, 11 games a year, when they're playing in New Year's Six or now the 12-team playoff – College football is better. You want them back. I think Matt Rule's the guy. I, I think he he brings a little spice up there to Lincoln. He's being able to recruit uh, the NIL and all that good stuff. Like he's bringing it. I think that was one of the biggest knocks on Nebraska is that all these people kept saying, "Well, how do you get eighteen year old kids to go to Lincoln, Nebraska? How do you get eighteen year old kids to go to Lincoln, Nebraska?" Uh, that's the downside of it. Well, Matt Rule was like, "Hey, I'll show you." 
watch this. All right, I'm, I'm going to attack recruiting. Uh, I'm going to attack the portal. One thing I, I will say to Nebraska fans is just be patient. It's it's a it's a it's a process. My Auburn Tigers are going through it right now. Trust me, we hear New Mexico State jokes every single day. Right? <laughs> but just be patient. Recruiting takes time. That's what I try to tell my fans, uh, people that listen to, to my Auburn show. Is you're in you're in a talent gap right now, where it was you were in such a bad spot that it's going to take a couple recruiting classes for Matt Rule to kind of stack some talent. And then he'll be able to fire off. Then the things at Nebraska will get going, man. Um, this year, yeah, like if if Nebraska gets to seven wins, in my opinion, uh, party, tear the city down, like <laughs> uh, go crazy, like uh, I, I and I think they can do it. I think they can do. It. I'm huge on Dylan Raiola. I, I think that was an absolute steal. How he went about it too is he was just kind of like, hey, I want to be a difference maker. Like, okay, I could go be the next guy at Georgia. We could keep winning, but I want to go be a part of this tradition. All right, where I've got roots over here. I want to be the face of that program, and. Th- you, you can already see he's already meshed with the fans, man, the ovation that he got uh, at the basketball game and all that good stuff. Like, I'm all for it. I think Matt Rule's the guy for Nebraska to get back. I am uh, – I want it for the fans for Nebraska. Like, I, I want it uh, – I, I want it for – especially, like, your brother, man, your dad. Like, huge, diehard Cornhusker fans and uh it's they're just yeah they're right over here. <laughs> okay there we go man like like I, I want uh I want them to be back and I, I do I think it's better for the game of college football when when they are competitive. Yeah yeah absolutely I mean and another thing too that you know, that I think Rule does so well is he gets the guys that are here in, in Nebraska. Uh but correct me if I'm wrong Carter Nelson is also from Nebraska isn't he Carter yeah. Nelson so, yeah, yeah, that's, Nebraska. Yeah, yeah and then also Daniel Kalen another Nebraska guy uh, um, Caleb Benning, my co-host son, yeah. is is gonna be in the defensive backfield for Nebraska next year. Um, Tavion Thompson. Well, and, and talking about you know needing a passing game to get moving, Carter Nelson being a big big guy, five star tight end coming out of Nebraska, getting that that corn fed tight end in there and, <laughs> and getting him going, getting them rolling. That's gonna be a big piece to this offense too, trying to get a guy like that. Um, but Jeremy, how you feeling about these Huskers coming into what feels like a new year? I'm going to go off one thing. Absolutely, please. Be Colorado by 50. <laughs> That's all that I can't get off my mind just because I, I don't even know how. Looking at last year what Nebraska and Colorado played, I don't even know how they're going to even get Deion Sanders in the, in the Memorial Stadium without someone trying to go after him. I mean, <laughs> that's going to be uh, – they might have to literally have double, the, if not triple, the security just to make sure Deion Sanders doesn't they had, get – They had their, their gold chain stolen at USC. They're going to have the wheels off the bus oh this year God. here in Lincoln. <laughs> wheels off the bus. The bus will probably be on fire while the team's <laughs> playing, that's for sure. But, no, looking for Nebraska, it, this could definitely be a really good year. Like you mentioned, this could be before you play Ohio State where you can be 7-0. and I – I realistically think they could be easily five and two before they play Ohio State. Dylan Raiola, that's going to be obviously the big thing. That was, like you said, Blake, that was an absolute steal. And I don't know how you can really pass him up. That was the real big surprise. Just look at everybody that was literally trying to go after him. And he wound up in Nebraska, and it's great for Husker fans. And I'm definitely going to, I know I'm. there's probably some people out here, but I've never been to a Nebraska football game. You're gonna have to make that. Make I know. That, uh, the only uh, time change. I can, the only time I can sincerely say I've watched Nebraska is obviously out your family's house. Then that is definitely a time where, like you mentioned at the top, right before we start talking Nebraska, one side's an Oklahoma family, one side's an Nebraska family. You do not a know how much household. You do not know how much times <laughs> I have ran up and down, up and down, up and down those steps. I mean, I don't know how those stairs are still working, but I mean, looking for Nebraska, this is definitely going to be. I, it's a learning curve, obviously, like you guys have said. It's going to be a good year, I think, though, for Nebraska. The one guy that I can't get off my mind is Billy. Kemp. I know for what he was able to do and from what your brother, he's even told me about him and he's just been an absolute thing. But I know now that he's not with it's, Nebraska yeah. anymore, mm-hmm. but they're, the next big thing is who's going to fill in that shoe for Billy Kemp. It's going to be a fun season, but 
we're going to well, have. I think they've got plenty of guys to they fill those shoes. They definitely do, but they just got to find the right person to get into those shoes. Yeah, and, and overall, I feel like you know, if if you are able to go in, let's say six and one going into Ohio yeah. State, let's be realistic with it. Let's say you're able to go six and one. I feel like a guy like Dylan Riola has the talent, has the the poise. Um, because watching watching him in the spring game, he just felt, he looked so comfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I saw an article somewhere where somebody it was a Nebraska article, uh, and, and he said, "If this is what five star recruits look like their first year in, Nebraska should start getting some of those." <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, that, he he looks so comfortable back there. And again, yeah. that's just the spring game, so you don't want to jump to conclusions. But you know what he's capable of. You know the talent that he possesses, and you know the love of the game that he has. He's that kind of guy that kind of gives you a little bit of a man, maybe we could go into the horseshoe and upset the Ohio State Buckeyes. Ooh. That like, He gives you that hope, well, um, and, and, and he's just one of those players. And there's there's a lot of reasons to believe that, you know, the the poise is going to translate from the spring game, right? Because it's, you're not just looking at like, oh, he put up great stats in the spring game. It's like, how did it look, Yeah, right? It's it the little things. It finally looked like they were able to execute a passing game when they had to, right, mm-hmm. in third down situations and clear passing situations before yeah. – when they last year, when they when teams knew you were going to pass, it was a disaster. Well, three quarterbacks playing in that spring game with no interceptions. That's that's a great thing that I look at. That you know, no turnovers in the spring game. That's not something you could say in years past, even. Well, and, and you look at his, you look at Dylan Rillo's background, right? So he obviously his his dad played at Nebraska, played in the NFL. He works out with Patrick Mahomes. Mm-hmm. Like this is a dude that's been around professionals basically his entire life. His uncle played in the NFL. He's obviously on staff at Nebraska as the O-line coach. This dude has been around football and professionals his entire life. Go look at other sports and even guys that are playing in the NFL. When you've got a track record of being around professionals from a super young age, those guys translate super quickly and at a really high rate. And I think that's what we're going to see with Dylan Rayola because – he isn't going to be shocked by anything. He knows what to expect. Yeah. He's been prepared his entire life for this moment. He knows what it means to the state. He knows what it means to his family. I, I fully ex- – like, listen, he's going to have some hiccups just from a – he's a freshman. He's playing in the Big Ten. It's pow- It's like power football. There, it's not. He's not going to go out and win a Heisman this year. I'm not trying to say that. But I don't think it's going to be a, a capability or an overwhelming issue. He's going to make mistakes because he's a freshman. Right. But – I don't – I mean, I, I'm fully prepared for the quarterback play to be trim- – like, even if it goes from what it was last year to just average, mm-hmm. this is an eight-win football team. Yeah, definitely. Like, yeah. just average quarterback play. Definitely. And, and I, feel like, eight I feel like eight, eight wins this year, especially looking at that schedule, is what you would have to set the bar at and, and expect from this team uh, and, and going forward. Just don't uh, put it, in it, it, is, it is a totally different team, you know, when you, when you look at this team – from top to bottom. And well, I, I feel like it, it has that different energy coming from it as well. And yeah. there's like, you know, there's some scary ish names on the back half of the schedule, but okay. Yeah. After you go at Ohio state, which is, I'm just counting as a loss. That's fine. Like if they get an upset, like, uh, you know, like, like Blake said, it's like, going to look like Marty tear, tear the city down. Like, right. But <laughs> like UCLA isn't scary to me. No, like, they got a new coach. They're, they're rebuilding. That's not a scary team to me at all. Even under chip Kelly. That's yeah. scary to me. I brought up USC. I, I don't think that's a very good football team this year. I think there's gonna they're gonna have a lot of issues. I'm not saying they can't beat Nebraska, but I don't go in there and say, "Oh, that's definitely a loss." That's that's kind of a coin flip for me. Yeah, yeah I, I think so too. Wisconsin, I think is a coin flip too. Luke Fickle and Wisconsin are in almost the exact same it's position that in, Nebraska in, in is. Lincoln, and so I feel like that gives you an upper edge there. Yeah, I, I think the game that they're second most likely to lose is is at Iowa. That's a really tough game against a team that I'm obviously really high on on the road, mm-hmm. like. But you look at the back half of that schedule, and you're like, oh, there's there go Ohio State, UCLA, USC, Wisconsin, Iowa. There's only two of those games that I'm like, ah, oh, those kind of concern me, and that's at Ohio State and at Iowa. Mm-hmm. The other three I, I think are basically coin flips, which is I'll take that. Yeah. You give me coin flip games, I'll take those all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, looking at looking at this team, looking at the schedule they're given, I mean, it, it just feels like it could be a different different year for Nebraska, and I know that they're hopeful for that turnaround. It, it feels like every year it's, this has to be the year. Just make um, a bowl game. Just yeah. make a bowl game. That's all. That's all I'm asking. Don't let Jeff Sims throw the ball. <laughs> well, he's playing for Air State yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's that's if he wants to throw yeah, the true. ball, he can't as much as he wants. My he, couldn't even, he couldn't even catch the snap. What are you talking about throwing the ball? That's true. That's <laughs> true. You got to catch the snap before yeah, you can throw true. it. Um, but there's there's plenty more to talk about with the Big Ten. I mean, we we talk about it used to be a Power Five. Now it's 
really just a power four. But even when you really look down and boil it down, it really comes down to two conferences, uh, the SEC and then, of course, the Big Ten. And talking about these teams, I think the Big Ten is going to be really fun mm -hmm. to look at. Um, but we thank everybody so much for tuning in with us, for watching. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, go ahead and hit that like button, comment down below, uh, and hit that subscribe button as well. That helps us out a lot. Uh, you can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, all of that fun stuff. And then, of course, if you want to come here uh, to the Herd at Sports Bar and Grill and watch us live, we will try to keep posts uh, you know, and updates there on social media. This one was more of a last-minute scheduling, so it wasn't as, as advertised. Um, but make sure to come out if you're in the Omaha area and come and check us out and come watch us and watch us live here at Herda, Herd at Sports Bar and Grill here in La Vista and also at a location over in Gretna as well. Um, but we won't be there. Um, <laughs> but anyways, we thank everybody so much for tuning in, watching and listening. Uh, thank you so much for your support. We'll catch you next time.